So with this, without any further ado, we will take the first question from the brother, please. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I am Ibrahim. I am from Bangladesh. Uh, I am a teacher. Uh, now I, I am studying uh, at Unimap. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have any plan to unite all the Muslim scholars in the same platform? I think it's important because people follow the Muslim scholars. If Muslim scholars are united, then Muslims, general Muslims, uh, gradually united. The brother asked a very good question, that do I have plans to invite the Muslim scholars on one platform? And you may be aware that I come from Bombay, and in Bombay we had five major peace conferences. Three in Urdu, two in English, where we invited the 30 best English scholars on one platform from all over the world, America, Canada, UK, Somalia, Egypt, Sudan, different parts of the world, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and it was the largest Islamic conference organized, where we called of different people from, all, from different parts of the world. We had twice in English, 2007, 2009, and three times we had in English, 2008, 2010, and 2011. And we had more than a million people over the 10 days. The conference was so successful that the enemies of Islam, they could not digest it. So much so that they banned the organization. And happy that I'm here because of it. And we had to do the sunnah of the Prophet and do hijrah from India. I'm an Indian. But Alhamdulillah, it was the largest in terms of technology, in terms of people attending, Alhamdulillah, in, in the terms of way it was organized. Inshallah, if Allah wills, and if Allah gives an opportunity for me to have such conference in other parts of the world, Inshallah, it will be my pleasure. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have the next question, please, brother? Uh, hi, good evening and uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Sheridan. I'm actually from Kuala Lumpur. Um, I'd like to ask a question uh, ab um, about this issue right now. I think you have been very aware in Malaysia. C can you hear me? Can the audio technician please adjust the microphone? There's too much of bass in it. Can you reduce the bass and increase the treble, please? Yes, brother. Can you start again, please? Uh, is this better? Better, but uh, can you increase the eyes? The I person on the audio panel, can you increase the high frequency and reduce the low frequency? Hello? Just kidding. Here, can you, is this better now? Come closer to the microphone, yes. It's not your fault, it is the fault of the technique. Yes, brother. Oh, okay. So it's, is it? It's better than before, yes. You're most welcome. Better now? Yes. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I'm sure you've been aware in Malaysia right now that uh, Muslims have been divided over this issue called the International Convention Against uh, Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, I think there's been a lot of news reports about it. Uh, I'd like to get your views. You know, since you spoke on the, the importance of unity, is this an issue that Muslims should be divided over to the point whereby some of them want to take to the streets? to protest against other Muslims who, who are okay with it. Thank the you very much. The brother asked the question, the, what are my views regarding the Muslims gathering for some ICD, whatever he said. He wants my view. Brother, I have not discussed with any of the people of Malaysia regarding this. Yes, I do read news in the newspaper of Malaysia. But tell you frankly, I don't trust the newspaper of Malaysia. But what they write about me is only wrong, so how can I trust about others? especially about the English newspapers of Malaysia. I can tell you for sure what they write about me, more than 50% is garbage. So when they're writing about me, a man of truth, wrong things, how can I trust what else they write? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hujura, chapter number 49, verse number 6, whenever you get the information, you check it up before you pass on to the second person. I as a Muslim, 
Many people follow me. I cannot give comments on what the newspapers write. And media, international media as a whole, not 100%, majority, they write for their own benefit. In India, the same thing. Almost all the newspapers, there are some newspapers which are honest, very few. You can count them on your fingertips. Most of the media, they write for the benefit that if they are going to sell more, so they make a news. You know, now they made a news. Oh, Zakir Naik resurfaces in Perlis. Oh, he, and they go back. Oh, he's banned in India. He do this, he's doing that and all. You know, want to create fitna. You are asking me to comment on the newspaper. Sorry, I cannot. And neither have I discussed with anyone except what I read in the newspapers and I cannot trust. So if I cannot trust, I cannot comment. Otherwise, surely it would be a pleasure to comment on that. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Can we please have the next question from the sister, please? So I don't understand your last question, sister. How do we avoid? Uh, how do we avoid racism in multiracial society like Russia? Racism or racism? Racism. Racism. Sorry. racism. Yes. <coughs> sister has a question about Surah Hujura, chapter 49, verse number 13. And does it talk about supremacy of Islam? I'll give the translation of that verse. Surah Hujura chapter 49 verse number 13 says, Ya yuwan nasu inna khalaqnaakum zakrin wa unsa wa jalnaakum shum ba wa qaba ila li ta'arafu inna karmuk min da Allah yatkaakum inna Allah alimun khabir which means, O humankind, we have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa this verse of the Quran doesn't talk about supremacy of Islam. It talks about that all human beings are equal in the sight of Allah. It doesn't talk about supremacy of Islam. It talks all human beings Allah has divided them into nations and tribes. Otherwise, Surah Rum chapter 30 verse 21 says, Allah has made you into different colors and different languages. So all this is so that you recognize each other, not that you shall fight each other. That means according to this verse, Sex is not the criteria for one human being to be superior to the other human being. Wealth is not the criteria for one human being to be superior over, over the other human being. The color of the skin is not the criteria. Uh, the age is not the criteria. The only criteria is taqwa, God consciousness. So here Allah is talking about all human beings are equal, whether black, white, brown, yellow, whether rich, whether poor, whether king, whether pauper. Whichever part you stay, whether in America, whether Malaysia, whether India, whether Pakistan, whichever part you stay, all are equal. The only criteria that can make you superior is taqwa, God consciousness, piety. About supremacy of Islam in other verses. But this verse is talking about taqwa. The only way is taqwa regarding a question. How can we solve this problem of racism in this multiracial society. Sister, Islam is against racism. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in his last farewell Hajj, Hajjul Bida sermon, he said that no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. Neither a non-Arab superior to an Arab. No, no, no black is superior to a white, neither a white superior to a black. So in Islam, Race doesn't make you superior whether you are American, whether you are English, whether you are Malay, whether you are Indian. All races in the sight of Allah is equal. All races are equal. This is Islam. And I believe that the constitution, even this country, they believe the federal religion is Islam. Yes, what you can do you can help the people who are deprived to uplift them, that is different. If people are deprived, if you feel this community is deprived and I want to help them because they are deprived, that's a separate issue. That you can do. 
But you cannot say I'm a superior race. I'm an Arab, therefore I'm more superior. I'm an Indian, therefore I'm more superior. I'm a Malay, therefore I'm more superior. I'm an, I'm an American. No. In Islam, all are equal. All human beings are equal, but it doesn't end there. It says that highest is taqwa. And you follow the guidelines of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot say all are equal and then you start doing things which are not correct. You can't go and rape someone, say we are equal. You cannot make prostitution common. Cannot make drug addiction allowed. All these are guidelines laid by Allah. That means human beings are equal, but you don't allow them to spoil the society. So the guidelines for the society is the glorious Quran. This Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the whole of humanity. It is the future world constitution, the do's and don'ts. You don't have to have a conference to know what is good or what is bad. Our creator already gave it to us. Only thing what you have to do is you have to study it and implement it. Study this, study the seerah of the Prophet, study the hadith of the Prophet and all the replies are there. Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. So if you know that there is a problem in society, whether it be American society, whether UK society, whether Indian society, whether Malay society, whether Saudi society, check it with the Quran. If you are following the rules of the Quran, then that problem will be solved. If you grow against the teachings of the Quran, the problem will be there. This Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. It is so easy. But if we Muslims have faith in Allah and His Rasul, we will be top of the world. Today, we want to satisfy other people rather than satisfy Allah and His Rasul. Today, we are more knowing what will the UN tell us? What will this country think about me? You are more bothered about what will others think about me? You are more bothered about pleasing others than pleasing Allah and His Rasul. If you please Allah and His Rasul, irrespective, you have problems in this world, the Akhirah would be Jannah. But we should have that faith. Do we have that faith? So if we have that faith, that Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. Islam has the solution to the problems of humanity. And study Islam and you see wherever Islam has been implemented in its true form, you get results. And the best example is the time of the Prophet and the Khulfa Rashidin. You know the people, the non-Muslims, they invited the Khalifa, Hadha, Umar and others, come and attack our place and remove our ruler so that we have a beloved ruler like you. And people say Islam was spread by the sword. Now, you cannot give example of a single Muslim country anywhere in the world. Sorry to say. Not a single Muslim country any of the world where you can say is following Quran and Sunnah in total. Some parts, okay. But overall, no. Inshallah, Allah, I ended my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran. From Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 33. Surah Fatah chapter 48 verse 28. And Surah Saf chapter 61 verse number 9. Who will the Arsar Rasul Hobida? What din al Haq? Liu Zira wa Aladdini Kulli. That Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, all the wisdoms. And enough is Allah as a word. Then the day will come. And there are various say hadith. It will come when, inshallah, there will be peace and at least we will rule for seven years. The full world will have that proper peace, etc. We don't know when it will come. And if it comes when we are alive, Alhamdulillah. And that's the reason we should strive to follow Quran and Sunnah. Whether others follow or not, don't tell why is not he doing, or why is not that person doing. At least you follow yourself. At least I should see that I am following Quran and Sunnah. The people always point fingers, oh, he's not doing, that one is not doing, that Muslim is not doing. He's not doing. At least let us follow. Imagine if all the thousand people are here, we thousand start following hundred percent, Alhamdulillah. The world will be a better place. Right or wrong? So inshallah, we make it, uh, uh, we make it a target today 
that inshallah all of us will try and follow as much of Quran as we know to the maximum possibility. Yes or no? Yes. Do we agree we'll follow the Quran and the Sai Hadith? Please yes. raise your hand. All of us? MashaAllah. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may He give us the hidayah and the guidance so that we stick to the Quran and Sai Hadith. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Can we now please have the question from the sister, please? has the question that there are some da'wah organization and they are trying to call people towards Allah, towards Islam but many a time they themselves are not following the Quran Sunnah then how should we be able to get them closer to Quran Sunnah Allah says in the Quran Surah Saf, chapter number 61 verse number 2 preach not those things which you do not practice so it's a it is a requirement for a da'i that he should at least practice the thing which he is preaching. No one can say he's 100% perfect, but at least the things he is preaching, he should practice. And we see that, alhamdulillah, many of the youngsters, when they inspired with dais, like for example, Sheikh Ahmad Dida, they inspired thousands of people, including myself. When they get inspired, they may be not very close to Quran Sunnah. But the moment they start doing dawa, as they keep on getting knowledge, their amal, their deeds also keep on improving. And when they read more of the Quran, they tell others, it implements. And Alhamdulillah, most of the time, we find that the da'is keep on coming closer to Islam. But I do agree with you. There are times when da'is, they talk about Islam, but they themselves don't follow. This happens when, sister, mainly when we start thinking that we are the one who are giving that. So I am a dai. I am going to convert people. It is Allah who is giving that, not that dai. He starts thinking, okay, now I, I will do a technique of doing dawa. My technique is the best. When he starts saying, my, 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 then the downfall, shaitan comes. And the shaitan is more after those who are dais. So then the dai starts thinking, okay, you know, I am great. So then you find that he says, okay, the prophet said, keep a beard, not required to keep a beard. You know, I did my research, beard is not required. We start, you read the style of the, all the four Ayma, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Ahmad Ibn Nehmbal, Imam Malik, all four of them said that beard is first. Now where is the research of yours coming that beard is not required? Okay, even if it's not really the scholars are saying, keep it. Tomorrow if you come to know it is for what I'm going to do. There is a fatwa and there is a taqwa. The difference between fatwa and taqwa is that fatwa says something, even if you're not sure, the taqwa says do the better thing. No one says that keeping a beard is haram. Does any Muslim scholar say keeping a beard is haram? Some secular people may say keeping is not fard, but no one says haram. So better keep it. So when you find and you research and when there is difference of opinion, Difference of opinion, follow that opinion which covers both. Suppose one person says beard is far, other says it is sunnah. No one will say keeping is wrong. So, when amal, when you're praying, okay, praying jamaat. And the more you keep on following the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah, and Allah, you find success coming. If you see my Background, I was a stammerer. From childhood, I was a stammerer. If you would have asked me what's my name, I would say, My name is Da, 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 I used to stammer. 
I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor, best surgeon in the world. I couldn't have dreamt in my dreams in speaking in front of 25 people. When we started doing that, Allah opened up the pathways. And now we are speaking in front of 1000 people, 100,000, 1 million people. It is not because I am good. It is hazam in fazli rabbi. It is because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hazam in fazli rabbi. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 160 If Allah helps you, none can overcome you If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you So let the believers put their trust in Allah And when you find difficulties in your pathways That is the time the main guidance is Quran and Sahih Hadith So it's important, I'm aware I'm aware when I've been to the South, uh, Southeast Asian countries They do dua and they may, they may break certain but we have to guide them that we have to get them closer to the Quran and Sunnah. We have to see to it that our salah is very particular. Our pillars are very good. Our attitude, the way we dress, the way we talk, are we following the guidelines of Allah and His Rasul? The more you follow Quran and Sunnah, the more result will you get. And all this you cannot judge your dawah by number of people accepting. I cannot say, oh, one million people came, therefore I'm a great day. I don't know. I pray to Allah that may he accept my services. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there's a man who will keep on doing the deeds of Jannah till Jannah is only one feet away from him. One feet. But before he dies, he does the act of Jannah and he goes to Jannah. Then our beloved prophet said, there is a man who keeps on doing deeds of Jahannam, full life, till one feet is, till he's one feet away from Jahannam. Then before he dies, he does the acts of Jannah and he goes to Jannah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he accept our deeds. Allah doesn't require me or you to make his deen prevail the rubbish that we are. The moment a die starts thinking that he is the one who's doing all this, that is his downfall. It is hazam in fazli rabbi. Even if you, if you think you're going to follow the Quran, you, go, you won't get results, no problem. At least you'll get Jannah. No, if I follow Quran, you know, people will say, I'm backward, I'm this, I'm that. Let them tell you. No, people may call me a joker, I'm wearing trousers above the ankle. Difference of opinion. Some say it is Sunnah, some say it is Fard. I don't want to get into the debate. Some say it is Gunai Kabira to wear it below the ankle. I'm not going to go into the difference. But no one says wearing above that, wearing trousers above the ankle is haram. No one says that. So what do I do? I wear it above the ankle. I may look like a joker, but the same joker goes and meets the kings of the world and the presidents and the prime minister of the world. When Raj Kapoor keeps his trousers above the ankle, you want to follow it. Why not a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This is a thinking. I'm not debating whether it is farda or not. Let's not go into the argument. Imam al Dhabi says it's Gunai Kabira. All the four Imam says it is not farda. No problem. Let's not argue about that. But this is, one is fatwa, one is taqwa. Fatwa, okay. It is not farda. It is sunnah. Taqwa is, why don't I wear it? No scholar in the world will tell you that wearing above is haram. No, will, no one will tell you it's Mubah. He'll either tell you it is Sunnah or it is Fard. So you as a die, you should wear it. Who are you afraid of? You have Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an example. Me, I'm wearing a suit. Wearing a suit is not haram. Wearing a tie is not haram. But my trousers are above the ankle. I may look like a joker, no problem. So this is Taqwa. Who are you afraid of? Will my beard hurt anyone? People may call me a terrorist. Will it hurt anyone? This beard of mine. With this suit, no one will call me a non-Muslim. They will have I have a beard and a cap. Has to be Muslim. 100%. If I don't have a beard, someone may think I'm a kafir. Why should I give that opportunity? If the label shows your intent, wear it. So when you're doing dawa, irrespective whether you get result or not, please, result will not tell you whether you'll go to Jannah or not. Every day I pray in tahajjud that may Allah 
forgive my sin then put me in jannah we have we have faith in allah that he'll forgive but i cannot say that because i'm a dahi i'm giving lecture i'll go to jannah a main goal a main purpose in life is akhara if there is a firdaus and this can only be achieved by following allah and his rasul the awards you get in dawa will not take you to jannah our main award should be going to jannah jannat e firdaus jannat e firdaus alala seeing the face of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hope that answers the question sister can we have the next question from the brother please assalamu alaikum dr nai this is zakir nai my name is rashid um, i'm a government officer uh, talking about unity in the muslim umma okay uh, in terms of uh, scholars in malaysia i believe most of us uh, follow same uh, scholars but when it comes to uh, political ideology uh, we fall apart into certain sorry parties. i can't hear you clearly sister i am her brother can okay. you say a bit slowly because the microphone is not very clear microphone... can you speak a bit loudly and slowly okay all right better uh, talking about scholars in malaysia most of us follow same scholars but when it comes into political ideology we fall apart into certain parties my question is how to to unite them so that uh, all of us will be under one party and our voice will get stronger in parliament but that's a good you. question that when when it come to scholars we we follow one scholar but when it come to political party we follow different parties how to unite them the only way you can unite is on the basis of quran and sunnah you can unite the muslims whether he is a politician whether he is a businessman whether he is a comedy uh, academician whether he is a scientist whether he is a doctor whether he is a dai whether practicing only way you can unite this is a master key quran and sahih hadith and if that person doesn't want to follow quran and sahih hadith that means he may not be a good practicing muslim whether we win the seat or not whether we come to power or not all this is a test from allah this is a test from allah a main aim should be to unite the muslim umma on the quran and sahih hadith some people may not be following the quran but for the political gain they may say they are practicing muslim they may not be some people are practicing muslim when they come to power they show they are less practicing because they want to become <laughs> they want to continue being in power let not the politics of this world take you away from jannah you are a very bad businessman if you are going to barter the seat of this world for your seat in jannah you are a very bad businessman the seat in jannah is much more valuable so what we find that many a time in politics we are more bothered about maintaining a seat than maintaining the guidance of allah and his rasul in india i know many politicians who are far away from the deen but because they will win because they show they're islamic they will prove themselves islamic they may not be islamic there are some good muslim who come to power to show themselves secular what they do that they start start behaving secular they are good muslims before they came to power they were practicing muslim oh now because i have come to power if i wear trousers above the ankle what will people say so the trousers go below they have a beard they shave their beard they were practicing before so let not and allah says in the quran in surah imran chapter 3 verse number 185 allah says kullu nafsin zaikatul maut surah imran chapter 3 verse 85 kullu nafsin zaikatul maut every soul shall have a taste of death the final recompense will be on the day of judgment and the person who safe from the hellfire and enters jannah has achieved the objective of this world for this world is nothing but goods and chattels of deception all this is a test for us whether when i do business am i doing business according to the quran and sunnah when i am doing my academics am i doing according to quran and sunnah when i am doing my profession when i am doing my job am i honest or not so all this is quran and sunnah so the only way you can unite the muslim umma is on the quran and sunnah whether they come to it or not you at least be on quran and sunnah correct 
what should we say whether you are able to do it or not you stick to the Quran and Sunnah if everyone goes away you stick at least you will go to Jannah if I stick at least I will go to Jannah a Jannah is very precious you cannot barter the Jannah for anything in this world for any power in this world for any wealth million dollar trillion dollar zillion dollar you cannot barter it for the Jannah our beloved Prophet Muhammad said a believer lives in this world like a prison an unbeliever lives in this world like paradise so once a Jew approached a scholar I think Ibn Qayyum or Ibn Hajar and he told him that you are a judge you are so rich I am poor how come this is world is present for you and Jannah for me so he told him if you come to know what will happen to you in Akhira because you are doing shirk you will go to Jahannam this world will be Jannah for you and me if I follow the Quran and Sunnah and go to Jannah all this judge and the wealth is like a prison for me compared to the pleasure in Akhira so if we live like that that this life is the test for the hereafter and we follow the Quran and Sunnah inshallah peace will be with you if you understand the concept of Islam irrespective of what the enemies do to you you will be peaceful because your Jannah is in your heart not in the dunya hope that answers the question thank you can we have the next question please from the brother Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my name is Hadith bin Hayazi I have a question doctor this is about when uh, we are talking about unity okay can you speak closer to the mic can you increase the volume please the people at the audio the audio technician can you increase the volume please yes brother slowly and clearly okay. assalamu alaikum doctor wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh is, um, when we talk about unity in ummah uh, from my point of view that allah have been given me i think uh, one of the big aspect or the problem is and can you tell me the impact of our self or our role in solah jama'ah now we are no longer care or concern about it we are it's like a snake in our self is that it how how big is the impact of a self in solah jama'ah that is my question thank you very much i could not hear a question clearly but if i have understood I'll repeat it and say it's correct you were saying that today when we stand for our salah in the jamaat our rows are not straightened correct yes so that's the main question as a beloved part Muhammad before he started the salah you always said the straight in your row close in your gaps and do not leave any opening for the sitting and the hadith of Hazrat Anas Mella be with him he said that when we stood for salah our feet touch the feet of the companion our shoulder touch the shoulder of the companion so the right way to stand in salah is stand in a straight low straight row and your feet to shut the feet and the shoulder to shoulder and this is the right way but I know some of the people don't like touching each other's feet so you tell him nicely but this is what our prophet said that don't let if you leave any gap then the satan will come in between if you agree fine doesn't agree but don't fight over it that there is in the imam even today i heard the imam saying before he said malai but i could understand he said that straight in your rows closing the gaps so this is the way of the sunnah this is the afzal way the best way how you should pray but please over this issue don't fight oh my neighbor is not putting properly so then you start sticking and then your full salah is disturbed you keep on chasing him he goes on going far away from you then your khushu and salah is gone okay do to the best of ability try and touch no problem but don't be obsessed with it if someone who's your neighbor if he doesn't want to do it you cannot abuse him maybe when the salah gets over you can tell him nicely if he agrees follow doesn't agree no problem don't fight over it Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Next question from the sisters. Is there any question there? No? Okay, we will move to this mic over here. Please, sister. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Maria. I'm trying to get in Kuluchin 
obstetrics in Germany and Switzerland, and I'm working mainly with non-Muslim people. And I perceive that the most, like the biggest prejudice against Islam is about the equality between men and women. So my question is how to explain to them the, how it is in reality. Sister, the question that oh, she's a gynecologist and the major difficulty she has to try and prove the equality of men and women in Islam and how to do it. For the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette, Women Rights in Islam. I'll just give you in brief that in Islam, men and women are equal. But equality doesn't mean identicality. They're equal, but they are not identical. Let me give you an example. That if in a class, two students come out first, student A and student B. And in the question paper, if you analyze, there are 10 questions, each carrying 10 marks. When you analyze both the students who come out first, they get 80 out of 100. Student A, in question number one, gets 9 out of 10. Student B gets 8 out of 10. In question number two, student A gets 8 out of 10. Student B gets 9 out of 10. In the remaining question from 3 to 10, both get 8 out of 10. If you add up, both get 80 out of 100. But in answer to question one, student A is superior than B. In answer to question two, student B is superior to A. Overall, both are equal. So in some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. Men and women, they are made biologically different. They are made physically different. They are made psychologically different. So based on their biological makeup, the physiological makeup, the psychological makeup, the roles are different. Many times they are same, sometimes they are different. I cannot say, okay, fine, I am going to be equal to the woman and I want to give birth to a child. Allah has made me biologically different. And you are a gynecologist. No, no, I want to be equal to the woman, I want to give birth to a child. And you have some lunatics who keep on saying such things and then they want to change the gender. And you know what happens, let's not go into that. So men and women are equal, but they are not identical. For example, if a robber enters my house, I will not tell, I believe in women's liberalization, I will not tell my wife to go and fight the robber. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 34, that Allah has given more strength to the male as compared to the woman. So I should go and fight. When it comes to respecting the parents, our beloved prophet said, when a man came and approached him in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, that who deserves the maximum love and companionship? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that too. The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that too. Third time, the Prophet said, your mother. The fourth time when the man asked after that too, the Prophet said, your father. That means 75% of a love and companionship goes to the mother. 25% goes to the, to the father. That means mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. Father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. So where it comes to love, respect, companionship to the parents, the mother has a degree of advantage. Where it comes to strength, the men have a degree of advantage. So based on the biological makeup, the psychological makeup, the physiological makeup, men and women have different roles. They are equal, but not identical. For the complete reply, you can refer to my video cassettes, Women Rights in Islam, along with the question answer session. So based on each question they ask, inshallah, you can give a logical reply and convince them. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next question from the brother, please? Assalamualaikum. My name is Muhammad Junaidi. I want to ask, can we unite the, uh, uh, accept the people that they probably say they, they're Muslim, but they don't, uh, they don't accept hadith, uh, then they do the haram things, uh, like Siti Qasim. They probably invite people to accept the ideology. They're Muslim, but they, uh, they don't accept hadith. Brother asked a question that there are some people who are Muslim, but they don't accept hadith. A Muslim cannot be a Muslim if he doesn't accept hadith. You can call them pseudo-Muslims. The right word is what? Pseudo-Muslim. Because a Muslim, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu said, a Muslim is not a true believer until he loves Allah and his messenger more than anything in this world. 
Many people come and say that, you know, only following Quran, I'm, I'm a Quran yun. I'm a Quran. I only follow Quran. You ask him, how do you offer Salah? How many rakat to pray in Fajr Salah? Where it is mentioned in the Quran? Which verse of the Quran says, how many rakat to offer in Fajr Salah? Sorry? A hadith. Ah, no, but no. if you don't believe in Hadith, how can you follow Islam? Zakat is compulsory. How much percentage is zakat to give? Where it is mentioned in the Quran? Huh? Mentioned in the Hadith. So without Hadith, you cannot follow Quran. Quran is like a telegraphic message. How to some things of Salah is mentioned, but not all the details. Give zakat is mentioned. How much to give is not mentioned. So Quran is like a telegraphic book. The commentary is the Hadith. So without the hadith, you cannot follow Islam. That's the reason. And if you follow Quran, only following Quran also, you have to follow hadith. Because Quran says, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul. You know, all the references I give. Want me to repeat again? Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 32. Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 32. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 13. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 59. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 69. Surah Maidah chapter 5 verse 92. Surah Anfal chapter 8 verse number 1. Surah Anfal chapter 8 verse number 20. Surah Anfal chapter 8 verse number 26. I can go on, go on. Surah Anfal chapter 8 verse 46. Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 71. Surah Nur chapter 24 verse 52. Surah Nur chapter 24 verse 54. On and on. Atiullah wa atiur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So Allah says obey Allah and obey the messenger. So how can you follow the Quran? How can you follow this part of the Quran? This part of the Quran you can only follow if you follow the hadith. So that's the reason you cannot practice Islam unless you follow both the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. I know there are so-called pseudo-Muslims, so you call them pseudo-Muslim but not actually Muslim. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you. Next question from the brother, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shamsuddin Muhammad, uh, UNIMAP student. Uh, thank you, doctor, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, leadership at whatever level can play an important role towards uniting its followers. So, Sorry, brother, I cannot what? hear you clearly. Can you put the microphone on top? You are going down. Now. Put the okay. microphone on top. Yes. That's it, mashallah. Okay. Yeah, uh, my question is that slowly and clearly okay my question is that leadership at whatever level can play an important role towards uniting Sorry, its followers i only heard the word leadership can you speak a bit slowly and more clearly leadership yes. can yeah. what i my question is that what lesson can leaders both at national community or whoever among us find himself in a particular in a particular leadership position what lesson can we learn from the great leadership exhibited by our noble prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in terms of how he related to sahaba brother, brother can you make the question short you are saying so many sentences okay my question is make it my two sentences oh, yes. leadership leadership the community Say my, short and clear, yes. the answer will be this, brother. My question, doctor, is that what lesson, what good lesson can we learn from the... What le lesson can we? Can we learn? Can we learn? Yes, from the leadership style, from our noble prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, towards uniting Muslim ummah. MashaAllah. Simple question. He said, what lesson can we learn from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to unite the Muslim ummah? Brother, do you want me to repeat the lecture again? I gave a full lecture. What lesson can we learn from the Prophet to unite the Muslim Ummah? I quoted several hadith. I quoted more than 40 verses of the Quran. More than about 20 hadith. You want me to repeat again? Doctor, in terms of, uh, I'm talking in terms of relationship, how he related to Sahaba, how he, because at community level we have leaders, also, we may find ourselves in particular positions as leaders. So how can we relate within ourselves? As a leader, how can you relate to your uh, colleagues? How can you try to unite them? Or what? how can you uh, have a good relationship with them? That is my question. How can we unite yes. as a leader? 
master ki Quran and Sahih Hadith. Is there any better thing than the Quran and Sahih Hadith, brother? Do you know of anything? I said this in my lecture. I said that again. The best way to unite any Muslim of any profession, whether it be a doctor, whether it be an engineer, whether it be a politician, whether it be a leader, whether it be a sweeper, it is Quran and Sahih Hadith. Who says that? Not Dr. Zakir Naik. Allah says in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Wa tasimu bihablillahi jamia wala tafarruku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And Allah says, Allah say, and I told you that our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the believers unto one another are merciful, they are kind, they are generous, they are like one body. If one part of the body is hurt, the full body is in insomnia, spent sleepless and is in fever. So we can be united on the basis of Quran as well as Sahih Hadith. And if there are speciality, for example, if there are doctors, I will use the verses of the Quran talking about medicine so that he'll come more closer to Quran. If he's, if he's talking about leaders, then I'll quote to him about, uh, about the people that praise the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you know the Islam Martin, La Martin, he was a Frenchman who wrote the history of the Turk. And he says that if you want to, there is, want to know the genius of a man, and if three criteria are there, smallness of means, greatness of purpose with astounding results, if these three are the criteria, there is no human being who can come anywhere close to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If smallness of mean, greatness of purpose, astounding results, if these three are the criteria, no human being can come close to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Michael Eshad says, in the hundred most influential human beings in the world, he puts Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam number one. He says, many may object, many may challenge me, but there is no person who has been so successful in religious and security affairs like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. George Bernard Shaw said that if you read the history of this man, more than being anti-Christ, he should be called as the savior of humanity. If you read Thomas Carlyle, he wrote in the book, Heroes and Hero Worship, number one hero prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So these are the great people who the world says when they did their research, though they were non-Muslims, they called Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the best leader, as the best human being, as the most influential person. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, any question from the sisters? Okay. We have the question from the brother, please. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. My name is Faiz. Clear? Okay, uh, my question is, uh, first, I understand with the agree to disagree, uh, but the reality is now that Muslims are divided. Say, Muslims are divided and uh, one group of Muslims are getting support from non-Muslims. So my question is, if the second group of Muslims, can they get help also from the non-Muslims? If A, uh, the second group decides that they are uh, underhanded, not enough, uh, not enough resource, B, that somehow some, the non-Muslims have same goals so with the second Muslims. I the second part of the question. The first part I heard, it is echoing too much, so please speak a bit slowly, it will be better. Yes, brother. If the second group were to get help from the non-Muslims, if A, uh, the second group had, is seen as uh, underhanded or not having enough resources B, if the non-Muslims have same goals C, if the, this is an issue where uh, the second group sees the first group as deviants for example uh, LGBT or smoking because we have Muslims who are for LGBT, we have uh, Muslims who are for smoking but we also have non-Muslims who are against LGBT and smoking. So how about that? But that's the question that as one group Muslim takes help of the non-Muslim, can the second group think if the first group is deviated, etc., etc. Your judgment should be only on the basis of Quran and Sunnah. You judge the person on basis of Quran Sunnah, whoever is closer to Quran Sunnah you support. If there are two people, 
you choose the lesser of the evil if there are two people one is more evil one is less evil choose the lesser of the evil judge on the base of quran and sunnah if one person is following not 100 percent 80 percent quran the other is following 20 percent then choose the one who's following 80 percent so you have to make the decision based on your understanding choose the one who is a lesser evil let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss hope that answers the question thank you uh, next question from the brother please assalamu alaikum this is my second question to you uh, now what is going on uh, Syria and Yemen Muslim kings Muslim brothers how could we stop the war and how overcome the problem But there's a question that war is going on in Yemen, Muslims are killing Yemen, how do you solve the problem? Stop the war, problem is solved. Easy solution. Problem is some people are doing the war for their personal benefit. Some are doing it to sell their arms. Muslims are buying from non-Muslim arms, killing their own Muslim brother. The problem is easy, stop the war. But Muslim kills Muslim. Muslim killing Muslims, so both the Muslims should stop the war. That is the solution. If they don't want to stop the war because for their personal benefit, they will be punished on the day of judgment. Now, everyone cannot influence in stopping the war. Those who can influence, influence. Those who can't influence, then we do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the problem, as I told you in the beginning of my speech, that one Muslim is attacking the other Muslim, taking the help of the non-Muslim, because if they realize the teaching of Quran in Sunnah, never will ever Muslim wage a war against the other Muslim. Never. Unless the person is a Munafik. Because Muslims are brethren to one another. We cannot. We may have our differences. Unless they are absolutely a pseudo-Muslim. Otherwise, we Muslims should be united on the basis of Quran and Sunnah. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from the sister, please. If I heard you, if I understood your question correctly, that normally in the examination we say that we will work in the end, if six months are remaining, last month, we can study. So are you trying to tell the Muslims can also enjoy life and work towards the end of their life? Is this what the question is? Yes. So the Muslims can enjoy life now and work towards the end of their life, correct? A Muslim tend to do that way. Okay. So My question is, which Muslim knows how long will he live? I don't know whether he'll live till tomorrow or not. I don't know. Sister, do you know how long will you live? No. One year, ten year, twenty year, hundred, do you know? No. Even I don't know. Allah says in the Quran, very clearly, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 34, no one knows the hour, when will it rain, when will a person die, what will the person earn, what is in the womb of the mother, no one knows. That's the reason our beloved Prophet Wasallam said that to live, that you, I mean there's a saying, that you live you live as though you're going to die today and be prepared even for long time if you know you're going to die tomorrow what will you do sister hypothetically if you come to die tomorrow what will you do we what we work hard no 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 suppose you are the muslim to please who please what will you do then to work hard You will pray, you will do tahajjud, correct? Yes. So every Muslim, he should be prepared that he may die today or tomorrow. See to it, at least you do your faraiz. Do the mustaf. So if you know, if I think I'm going to die tomorrow, what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray properly, I'm going to pray the sunnah, I'm going to pray tahajjud, what if I die? And if I don't die, again tomorrow I do the same thing. <laughs> if I don't do tomorrow, again I do... Even if I don't die, am I losing? If I don't die, will I lose? Achha, suppose you think you're going to die after 10 years. 
and you don't pay and you die, will you lose? Yes. You lose what? You lose the na. So my win-win situation. Number one, when I'm praying, I get serenity. I get peace of mind. This money cannot buy. Most of the billionaires, they are not peace. People think, you know, money can buy peace. It cannot. It can't buy happiness. So when I'm worshipping Allah, I find peace. And believe me, if you believe in Allah and the teachings, you will not really bother everything is have I mean, A believer that when a prophet comes, he says, Alhamdulillah. When loss comes, he says, Alhamdulillah. This is Iman. And more the difficulty, more you are happy. Inshallah, Allah will give me Janat e Firdos. Like today, I am a Dai. The Indian government has taken everything, the property, the wealth. I think and I tell my wife that we should be happy. Imagine, suppose I call, if I am doing business and I lose my wealth, who's to blame me? If earthquake comes and my house goes, no benefit. If being a Dai, if the enemies of Islam have taken over my property, what better benefit can I get in Akhira? I am very happy. Nothing better could have happened for my property than what the enemies of Islam have done. Very happy. More peace of mind. They think they are causing me trouble. They are fools. They don't know that Jannah is my heart. Jannah is in my heart. If they put me in jail, I'll do zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they exile me, I'll do tafakkur contemplation. If they execute me, I'll become a shaheed. They cannot take the Jannah which is in my heart. So moment and a true believer, he's always at peace. If you know Islam, you will enjoy every day of your life. It is the fool to think, okay, if I drink alcohol, if I go to drugs, I'll enjoy, so let me enjoy now and maybe I will pray after 10 years. Fool. The kick they get in the drug and the alcohol, we get million times peace and serenity in our salah. Are they free? <laughs> they have to pay money. We have got health problems. When we pray, our health becomes better. Free. The serenity we get, it is all, if you heard my talk, I've given a talk on the Quran, the guidance for creating happiness. All this is artificial happiness. Immediate. The true happiness, you can get it in Salah. And the things, some people like dancing, music. Some people like listening to Islamic lectures, reading the Quran. It is you who decide what is good and what is bad. Happiness is a state of mind. You know, like you like some people like Chinese food, some people like Malay food, some people like Indian food. Food is food. It is subjective. Similarly, peace and happiness, it depending upon your mind, how you train your mind. If you train your mind, I'm going to get peace in Sarah, you're very happy with it. But the Prophet never said that you renounce the world. Like the Hadith of Abdullah, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, the Prophet said, I heard that you fast every day and I heard that you pray the full night. He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, fast one day, don't fast the other day. Pray part of the night, sleep part of the night. Because your body has right over you, your wife has right over you, and your guests have right over you. So Islam doesn't believe in excesses. Islam doesn't mean you renounce the world. So if you think you're going to pray the full night and fast every day and go to Jannah, that is against the sunnah of the Prophet. Prophet never told that you fast every day. Prophet didn't say that you pray the full night. So there is limitation, there is maximum. If you do above that, it becomes excessive. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 171, Allah says, Do not commit excesses in your religion. Committing excesses is also haram. There is a minimum, maximum. Minimum salah is five times salah. Minimum. Minimum salah. 17 plus 3, 20 minimum. Then you can do, you want to pay more? Okay, 12 rakat mustahab salah. Then tahajjud, another 8 rakat. It's tahajjud. The best salah after the five times salah is the night salah. Tahajjud will come first, then would come 12 rakat. Sunnat e moqeda. You want to read more? Okay, 4 rakat salah to duha, ishraq salah. Want to pray more? Sunnat e gher moqeda, 8 rakat. But you cannot sell pray the full day. So minimum, 
Okay, fine, you want to come to the mosque and pray, that's a requirement. If you come to the mosque and pray only five times, okay, you, you may require two hours a day. If you want to pray more tajud, etc., and sunnata gair mokada, mokada, maybe three hours, gair mokada, maybe four hours. There is limit, minimum so and so, maximum, you can't do above that. So everything in Islam, fasting, you can't fast every day. Minimum fasting is the month of Ramadan, 29 or 30 days, minimum. You want to fast more? The best after the fast of Ramadan is the fast of Muharram. After that, the fast of Ashura. You want to keep more? Okay, the fast. <laughs> Ten days of the Lajah. Want to fast more? Shawwal fast. Want to fast more? Okay. The white days. Ayyam will be 13, 14, 15th of every month. Want to fast more? Monday and, Monday and Thursday. That's what the Prophet did. This is the Sunnah. If you want more, then the fast of the Salam every alternate day. Finish. Beyond that, you cannot do. This is the limit. So everything in Islam, minimum and maximum. Is there? But you'll only know if you have knowledge. If you read the Quran and Hadith. So, if you think like those people who are fools, that I will only study towards the end. We ask them, when is the end? We don't know. So in this, you tell that person, for you, your examination is only once a year. Our examination is every day. The difference is their examination is once a year. So maybe you can fool the teacher and study only towards the examination. Our examination is every day, every hour, every minute. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question from the brother, but before that, how many more questions do we have? Any more? Okay, we will take this as the last question then. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, just a moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I see the number of hands? How many of you want to ask question? One over there. Two. Okay, so we, this will be the last three questions then. Okay, brother, please go ahead. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To Dr. Zakine. My name is Zul Hazri from Penang. We know non-Muslim is under Islamic government known as Kafir Zimi. So my question is, if they are a non-Muslim, who are loudly insulting Islam, uh, hate Islam, and plan to destroy Islam. Should we call them a kafir harbi, this, which is this category should be killed by a government? Uh, is it still kafir harbi still relevant in this okay. country? Uh, or brother, we should, excuse me. The yeah. topic for today is the importance of unity in the Muslim Ummah. So ask a question regarding among the Muslim Ummah. You have any questions on the Muslim Ummah itself? Uh, no. Okay, never mind. So we will move forward to the next I question see. then. Sorry. Okay, question from the brother, please. Thank you very much, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Zakir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Ahmad. Uh, I am a retired government servant. This uh, question just come to my mind about unity in the Muslim Ummah. I'm referring it to uh, on a wider and global scale. Uh, before that, I'd like to mention that... Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Can you just move a little further from the mic? Yes, that's good. Uh, I would like to mention for more than 1,000 years, the Muslim Ummah were united under one nation and one leadership. One nation is the uh, Daulah Islamia until 1924. 1924 was the time, was the year when the last Muslim Ummah came down. That was the uh, Daulah Osmania. After 1924, the Muslim community separated and divided into more than 40 
40 small and weak countries with more than and more than 40 leaders so my question is is it time for the muslim community now to work towards a uh, uh, i mean uh, building one nation for example from morocco to indonesia and uh, one leadership to get the real unity brother the Alhamdulillah. question that the khilafa the last khilafa we had the khilafa of islam uh, osmania and turkey which was by the enemies of Islam, they got together and they had it abolished and they were protest throughout the Muslim Ummah in 19, uh, 1924 and you forgot to mention there was a pact there was a pact by the enemies of Islam which made with Ataturk that for 100 years they cannot claim and that 100 years is going to end in the next 5 years I think it's 1923, it's not 1924 so in 2023 or 2024, after five years, this pact between the enemies of Islam and Ataturk of Turkey is going to end. And we have one bold Muslim leader, the Erdogan, who is fighting with the odds. And Alhamdulillah, we pray to Allah that may Allah support him. And the full world is against him. They tried a coup to remove him. Allah helped him. Alhamdulillah. And he's fighting against the Western world, being in Europe. That there is any change from the prime ministership to presidentialship. And he won that. And we leave it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We pray for him. Inshallah, if the Muslim is again united in one banner. But the problem is, most of the Muslim countries would not want to be under one banner. The problem is the Muslim. If all the Muslims today, 2 billion Muslims unite under one, they will start thinking, if he becomes the leader, where will my seat go? So I don't think so. Unfortunately, the Muslim countries will agree. But if they agree, and a common, they can come and discuss common, not that anyone wants to take away your, your power. Even if they take away your power and give you Jannah in in return that's a very good bargain but the problem is how many muslim politicians in the world they care for jannah how many i don't know any maybe you can count on your fingertips very few so we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the enemies of islam are joining together and many of our muslims are helping the enemies to attack the muslims what more do you want what can you do this is the state our beloved prophet had predicted. He predicted it. We at least, number one, what you should do is see to it that you, I should see that I myself, am I following the Quran or Sunnah? Allah will not question me on the Khilafah when I am not responsible for it. First, Allah will question me, am I following or not? Yes, if I am someone who can really make a difference, Allah will question me. But first I should see that am I doing my faraiz or not? My salah, my zakat, my psalm, my dawa, my good deeds, am I honest or not? I should not be corrupt, I should not be dishonest, I should be loving, all these things. If everyone takes care about that, inshallah the ummah will become better. But the problem is we don't read the Quran and Sunnah with understanding. And anyone who follows Quran and Sunnah, you say the person is backward. Who is more forward than our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I don't know anyone who is more modern than the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, may He unite the Ummah, whether they do it or not, whether Erdogan does or not. But there are various hadith of a Prophet talking about that. The times of of Akhara, the signs of there are minor signs, there are major signs. Minor signs, many have come. The last final messenger came. Then, inshallah, Isa alayhi salam will come. Then, Mehdi alayhi salam will come. The Prophet has given basharat that those people who support Mehdi alayhi salam, they'll be given hash level in Jannah. And then, there'll be a fight. Then, there'll be a war. Then, the, again, Khilafat will be reinstated. Inshallah, it will 
whether we live or not we don't know it will come what we should do presently is we should see to it that we do our duty what allah and his rasul had told us that is number one your personal then your society then the higher level and inshallah inshallah as long as we stick to quran and sunnah we keep on following it we keep on propagating it inshallah inshallah allah doesn't require you and me or any politician to make his deen prevail allah doesn't require ardogan or anyone allah doesn't require zakir to make his deen prevail i mean the rubbish that we are allah is going to make his deen prevail and it will happen the quran has said that we only pray to allah that may he make us instrumental so that we get jannah easily hope that answers the question thank you very much Okay, can we have the last and the final question from the sister, please? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Paul. Brother, I'm very interested and concerned with one of our brother's questions just now. As asking about the obligatory of straightening the rule while performing salam. Uh, like our brother said just now, it is hard for some people to straighten the road while performing solat jamaah. So, doctor, can you explain what's the connection between the significance of straightening the road and the unity of the ummah, and also the impact of not doing so, and why did our prophet sallallahu urged the Muslims? To do that. Thank you. The sister asked the question that what is the importance of straightening the rows and unity the Muslim Ummah. See, when we talk about unity, people talk about theory, Islam shows you practically. When we talk that we are against racism, we practically demonstrate it five times in our salah. That when we come together, whether king or pauper, when we stand for salah, we stand in the same row shoulder to shoulder. Quran or Hadith doesn't say that the king cannot stand, the rich one stands first and the poor one stands behind. No, whoever comes early, he's in the first row. Whoever stands in the first row, he gets more sawab. And our beloved Prophet said, do not let anyone get up from the seat for a person who comes late. That is also prohibited. So where is Hadith? So if a poor man comes first, he gets more sawab. The Prophet said the one in the first row gets the maximum sawab, then the second row, then the third row. The Prophet before starting the salah, he said, he turned behind and said, straighten your rows. The feet should touch the feet and the shoulder to shoulder. Why? So that if we have any racism that I'm white and he's black, I'm rich and he's poor, that racism is removed. Shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet. Hazrat Anas Malabi peace with him, he said that when we Sahaba stood, our shoulders touched the shoulders, our feet touched the feet. When they went in Ruku, if it wasn't straight, the Sahaba used to straighten. When you go in Ruku and you realize that the, that the, that the Saf is not correct, that time, but naturally when they in the Ruku, they can see the feet, they straighten. It is what is the importance? The importance is so that if there is any ill feeling between your brothers, that ill feeling is removed. Do not leave any gap for the Satan. Meaning what? Meaning so that the love of the brotherhood is increased. It's very important. But again, if some people don't have knowledge and they don't want to do it, don't fight because that will be a fitna. Straightening is important, but if your neighbor who is a Muslim, he doesn't know the hadith, he thinks it's not required and he runs away from you, you don't spoil your salah. Do you understand? It's a, praying salah is more important. Straightening is absurd. You should. But if the person doesn't know, he doesn't want to come close to, he's running away from you. I know some people, you go close, they go run away. What are you going to do? And you cannot chase them the full salah. You try it once, happens good. So don't make it troublesome but according to say hadith yes you should straighten in the row you should stand in the same row it's important don't leave any gap and that's what most of the imam before starting the salah say this increases the brotherhood hope that answers the question sister. 